So what are the ethical questions that kind of come up with um, wordplay games about um, meanings of words? And let me see if I can minimize. There we go. Uh, meanings of words. So I am Michael Duma. I'm from Idea Games. I've been working on a a, a word association game uh, for a number of years now, and I'm co-presenting with Crystal Lee Malone, who's a uh, a collaborator of mine, and she's more on the research side of things. And I think for simplicity, she'll just introduce herself when she comes on. And uh, I'm the creative director for a mobile word game about um, uh, a mobile word association game. I started about uh, six years ago. It's won a number of awards. It's in beta right now. And we're still working on adding content and researching what the uh, the impacts uh, of the game could be. So this is kind of going to be a taste of some of the things that I've learned from working on the game and also some of the kind of more research um, sides because we got seed funding from the National Science Foundation. So word association games, what, what are they not? So they're not spelling games. Uh, that's a big market. Lots of people love them. Uh, but usually the meanings of words doesn't really matter. And they're not crossword puzzles. Uh, crossword puzzles are also great. They've been they went viral about a century ago. Uh, people have have played them a lot. Uh, I think they're better on paper. And one of the issues that crossword puzzles kind of um, show is 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 a problem of the of the niche. So who plays them? Well, they tend to be male, white, middle aged, heterosexual. Uh, if you look at surveys of who's playing them, uh, all those little white areas that you see are going to be white people. And it's a tough problem to solve. So why is there this bias? Well, nobody knows all of the words in, in the tree of knowledge and in, 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 the, in the domain of, of lexicography. So there's the easy words, there's the harder words. And so any single solution game is gonna have to be optimized for a niche. And I think that, that if you can come up with game mechanics that have more ways to win, that you don't just have a single solution, but you have more, that you can do more branches of that tree and that opens things up. So word association games, they're about the, the meanings of words. Uh, they can be expensive to make, especially um, uh, just, just moving through them. If you think about making like five sets of words that are about five words, like you can do this in your mind, but when you start having more topics and, and, and more words in them and you wanna avoid conceptual overlap, it becomes a real, a real mess, but it's become a lot easier in the era of, of AI. AI is kind of more of a brainstorming tool, not um, like your final solution. I think there's a lot of potential benefits from uh, word association games, and it comes with risks also. There's the risk of, of putting your foot in your mouth when you're doing it or, or missing your audience where they're at. Uh, but overall, I think it's an untapped gaming subgenre. So we didn't grow up with word association games other than a couple like, um, like kind of like party games. Uh, because it's totally impractical in the real world. You can't just have a whole bunch of paper cards and and you, you, they're, they're here and there. But on, on a touch screen, uh, it can all filter and just be the little bit that you need. So I think that in the digital era, uh, word games can really come, come into their own more. There's no physical constraints. There's multiple pathways to victory. And they can be mashed up with different mechanics. Uh, they can be more inclusive. So giving players a sense of, of being, of, of feeling seen, of, of belonging, uh, personal touchstones in the content, uh, they can be personalized. But before we talk about the good, I'll tell you about some, some examples of um, in, in, in constructing puzzles uh, that, that we ran into. These are some real examples that I think are kind of illustrative. So uh, in the word association game, you're gonna have a word that's gonna be associated with um, like a set of other words. All right, so eggs and bacon, McMuffins, sausage, cornflakes, pancakes. These are comforting and familiar everyday foods, right? Well, what's wrong with them? Well, they lack a, a cultural diversity. They lack, they're, they're narrow in their representation. What about all these other people who, who eat other stuff for breakfast? And, and how do you even solve this? Do you, do you just load in lots more diversity and congee and miso soup and, and dim sum? Well, then it's everything's really big. Would you, do you filter it down? Maybe pastries of the world would, would work out. Bride, groom, husband, wife, wedding, anniversary, just love and commitment between adults, right? Well, what's wrong with this? Well, we were accidentally super narrow and heteronormative and just trying to talk about love. Lots of other kinds of love are out there. So how would you solve it? 
Well, just adding partner and romance and household and spouse just it opens up the uh, the range. And if somebody uh, uses other words, then then they, they notice that in the game and they and they they feel more included. Manicure, pedicure, chick flicks, gossip, magazines, romance novels, bubble baths. So this was one of our first attempts at these more playful topics. This was going to be guilty pleasures, hinting at the naughty. Well, what's wrong with guilty pleasures? Well, we were accidentally kind of layering in gender stereotypes and our own biases. Are, are these dudes, are these guys having a guilty pleasure? So how would you solve this? How do you, what, what, what facet of the issue could we keep without jettisoning it? So we wanted to move away from guilt or from gender. So what we did is we kind of focused on the pleasure. We renamed the topic, treat yourself. We added in chocolate and coffee breaks and, and game nights and massages and, and it worked. Anansi, Dracula, Goddess Lakshmi, Medusa, Sun Rukang, Thor. So this was kind of an interesting one because uh, it had a few few things that were, were going on. So we have these opposites levels. So normally the opposites level is like matching valley to Mount Everest or hot to glacier. And so we were doing opposites of the ordinary or historical. So when you're when you're auditing your own content, you have to kind of invert your brain as you're kind of going through the spreadsheet. And so it's going to be a list of fantastical figures. What's wrong with goddess Lakshmi? Well, we've got a, a revered Hindu goddess and the context really matters here. So she'd be fine in, in a list of, of, of deities, but we had an overeager contributor who was just trying to make it not be all super Western and thought, let me expand this list. But would you pair Jesus with Dracula like someone in the West? Like, oh no, I wouldn't do that. So Hanuman was the solution. It was a way to maintain cultural diversity. I interviewed dozens of people who connected to Hindu culture and they suggested that this is a popular and, and playful figure. It's not sacrosanct. And uh, we were able to, to do what we wanted to do in the first place. Keep in mind being diverse in your diversity, lots of different ways to do it, cultural, racial, uh, um, generational, gender, uh, geographical, different people, different parts of the world think about different animals. And then... A really interesting thing is just unanticipated things that you can do with language. When you're dealing with not just word lists, but how words are linked together, lots of words run into problems in certain contexts. So black animals versus black as a race. Uh, the word girl, uh, you're dealing with little girls, it's sexualizing, you're dealing with women, it's infantilizing. The word urban could be code for black. A uh, hippo is kind of a figurative derogatory offense for fat uh, people. Uh, a lot of context sensitive words, these tend to be derogatory with race or with, with sexual orientation. Um, Oreo, banana, red, fairy, um, buckwheat. Buckwheat was in the news last year. Uh, talk a little bit about some types of innovations that are happening. Uh, one is New York Times Connections and one is our game. New York Times Connections is an awesome game. It is now their second most popular behind Wordle. Uh, it's a grid, if you haven't played it, it's, um, a, it's a grid of 16 and, you, and your goal is to match uh, four groups of four together, you kind of tap on them. Uh, our game is more like a platformer. Uh, we deal with word meanings. We add in missing letters, kind of borrowing from the crossword puzzles. We have projectile physics. And so as an example of how you can match one, you can marry one element of games with, with other mechanics. Uh, accessibility and word difficulty is another important thing. I just want to kind of draw some attention. So there's a billion and a half people who speak English, uh, wide demographics, mostly second language. And uh, so the non-native English speakers, when they get conversational, maybe it's maybe somewhere between three and 4,000 words, uh, their vocabulary size can just vary a whole lot and among native English speakers too. So here's a graph. And the important thing about this graph, this is native English speakers, is these are percentiles. And you see that regardless of how you count vocabulary size, combining parts of speech and whatnot, the, the important thing is that from the 10th percentile to the 90th percentile, it's double, huge range in what adult native speakers know. So games can be adaptive. Uh, the way that we do this in the game is we've pre-classified all the words into certain difficulties. You can do that a couple of ways. Uh, we start off with a short uh, adaptive calibration quiz. So we ask a few questions, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. And you can really filter in to kind of what someone's level is. Uh, we aim for players to know about 80% of the words that are gonna be on the screen. And it's kind of tuned to a difficulty curve. So if you if you got a big vocabulary, it's not that just that we gate the words, but we're going to shift the words to tend to be harder. 
keep in mind generational differences. You know, kids today, right? What do kids know? I mean, they're born, you know, people born after 2010, they might not know Muppets. They might not know uh, who Yoko Ono is. And speaking of things that people don't know, uh, we start off our game kind of focused on the American audience. Uh, we made some assumptions about popular culture that people would know in Americana. It's not assumptions like to 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 try to be negative. It's it's assumptions to try to be positive and give people fun topics. But people don't know the same books. They don't know the same movies. They don't so know the, they know the same history. So in our case, we have accessibility settings to turn these things on and off. So potential benefits, just to kind of recap, I think that word association games have great option, great potential for cross-cultural understanding, for appreciating how complex systems are complicated. I think it's good for people to just have practice thinking, especially for scientific uh, uh, topics. Uh, I think there's potential for empathy and dissolving biases because you're making these associations that maybe are outside of your comfort zone. Uh, good for critical thinking and lateral thinking, and it's just fun to think about ideas. And so I'm going to pass it on to Chris Lee, who was thinking about how we can measure these types of things. Hello? Okay, good. Um, I'm gonna be super fast because I think it is more important to have time for questions and answers. Um, so my TLDR version of this talk is, um, so I'm gonna do a small scale diary study to gauge player reactions to foreign concepts in otherworldly. Um, I'm using the word foreign concepts lightly here. I'm going after words from cultures the player might not know, but then also going to try to incorporate um, the idea of feeling seen, right? Um, there, This has not yet started. I do not have data right now. I'm literally putting this together for the IRB. So I'm hoping that this will actually get done in late spring. Um, I came to this style of study through industry game user experience, not through um, more academically <clears throat> Uh, situated studies. I wanted to get deeper than a survey and have open-ended questions. That is the theory behind using this. And I am not bashing surveys. I might actually still use a survey. Um, but for what we're going after, a survey would not get there. Um, the hope is with the diary study to be able to gauge change over time. This is going to be done over a couple of months. Um, and questions such as, do foreign concepts become familiar? Do players approach foreign concepts differently over time, right? So maybe someone's not used to it, but they um, uh, will after. Wow, technical difficulty. My There we go. Sorry. Page wouldn't turn. <clears throat> um, and now it won't load. Never mind. I have backup. Uh, now, one could ask, does this matter? Uh, I'm a cultural anthropologist. I'm biased. I'm just putting out my bias up front. Um, yes, it matters. Uh, there's a prevailing idea that exposure to different cultures brings acceptance and understanding. But would that? But what constitutes enough exposure? Do you have to travel? Do you have to have a passport? Do you have to go live somewhere else? Um, would media count? Movies, etc. Would a game like this move the needle? And the answer is we don't know. So every time I have used the word hope here, it is because we have this theory. We haven't started data collection yet. So we're not really sure what we're going to find, but this is what we're going after. Um, and hopefully next year, I will have actual answers to these questions. Um, sorry for the tech difficulty. Uh, but yeah, that is the gist of it. So please, I think we have like two minutes left. If there are any questions. Uh, I'm looking at the Q&A. I don't see questions directed to uh, you personally. <laughs> if some panelists have questions, they can uh, unmute and ask them now. Otherwise, uh, we have the break right after. So people can ask their questions in the Q&A and you'll have 20 minutes to take time to answer those questions. Well, the only thing that I'll add is not a question, but it's like the potential. Uh, when you deal with word association, it's like it's like switching from something Scrabble-like, where it's, where it's kind of dictionary-centric to to books. So th there's just there's a lot of different ways that you can kind of start going with them, and and uh, you can use the same sets of words to like write Shakespeare as you can write like you know this is something completely science fiction. 
Uh, so I just think it's interesting as game designers to think about what are the ways that you could look at social issues, look at look at um, STEM education and, and, and whatnot using using word association.